By the end of this video, you'll know how to create flat pack furniture in Fusion 360. In this tutorial, I'll be referencing some different images and resources. To find them, head to my website at productdesignonline.com forward slash number two. Once again, that's productdesignonline.com forward slash number two. And that page will automatically redirect to the page with the resources for this tutorial. To get started, I'm going to change my document settings to inches since I'll be using some imperial plywood for this project. I'm going to toggle open the document settings icon in the browser, and then I'll click on the change active units icon. This will open up the change active units dialog box where I can select inches from the dropdown list. Then I'll click OK to confirm the changes. Then before I start with modeling, I'll hit the save icon in the upper left hand corner of the toolbar. And I'll save this as flat pack shoe rack. I like to set up user parameters with any woodworking projects in Fusion 360, whether it's a flat pack design or not. Now the parameters will make the model dynamic, which can be super helpful should you decide to change the board thickness later on. I also like to set up all the user parameters at the beginning so I can start using them right away as I dimension the model. Of course, this is only feasible if you sketch out your idea and have rough dimensions in mind. To do this, I'll find the change parameters option at the bottom of the modified dropdown list. You'll also see that I have the user parameter shortcut in my toolbar since I use it quite often. If you want to add the shortcut to your toolbar, simply click that settings or three dot icon and then select the pin to toolbar option. I'll now click on the parameters icon, which opens up the parameters dialog box. Adding or creating new parameters is pretty simple. I'll click the plus symbol next to the user parameters heading. You'll see this opens up a second dialog box in which we have to input a parameter name and expression. I've put an image of all the user parameters I used in this model on my website page that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. For your convenience, I've also put the link down below in the video description. So if you're familiar with setting up user parameters, then you can skip ahead a minute or so and grab that image in order to plug in the same parameters that I'll be using throughout the remainder of this tutorial. For the first user parameter, I'll add the thickness of the wood. When I eventually get around to cutting this out on a CNC, I'm going to use 3 quarter inch Baltic birch plywood. Therefore, for the name of the parameter, I'll type out the name of thickness. Then for the expression, which equals the thickness of the wood, I'll type out the nominal value of 0.728. You can also type out a relevant comment here in the last input field. If you find yourself creating a lot of user parameters within one single model, then this can be a great way to distinguish parameters without making the name of the parameters too long. I'll click the OK button to confirm this parameter. Then I'll click the plus symbol once again. I'll type out height for the name of this parameter, followed by the expression of 14 inches. This will be the overall height of the side panels of the shoe rack. I'll click the OK button once again, and this time I'll create the width user parameter. The width will be equal to the overall width of the shoe rack, or the width of the side panels. I'll type out 12 inches for the expression, followed by clicking the OK button. For the next parameter, I'll type out a name of length, which we'll use to set the overall length of the shoe rack. Then I'll type out 27 inches for the expression, followed by clicking the OK button. Next, I'll create a parameter for the size of the end mill bit that will be used in the CNC machine. 
I'll type out bit size for the parameter name, and then I'll make this 0.25 inches, which will equal a quarter inch in mil. And I'll click the OK button. I'm also going to create another parameter for a second in mil bit that I'll likely use for some of the inside cutouts where I want the radius of the corners to be smaller than a quarter inch. I'll title this one bit size 125 and I'll type out 0.125 inches for the expression which equals to the 1 8 inch and mil bit. Then I'll type out 1 8 inch and mil in the comment section so I know what this parameter represents when I look at this model on a later date. It's important to note that you can always go back and update or change parameters at any time, including their names, expressions, and comments. I'll add a comment for the first bit size parameter that says 1 quarter inch and mil. And all you have to do is click on the comment section in the dialog box and you can start typing out your comment. I'll also add numbers 2 and 5 to the end of the parameter name to better represent the quarter inch bit. The last parameter that I'll add is for the width of the cross beams. I'll title this one cross beam and I'll enter an expression of 1.5 inches followed by clicking the OK button. Now that we have our parameters set up, I'll click the blue OK button to close the dialog box, and we'll start off by creating one of the side panels of the shoe rack. To create the first side panel, I'll first create a new component by right-clicking on the top-level component in the Fusion 360 browser. From the right-click menu, I'll select the New Component option at the top of the list. Then I'll click on the component to select it and I'll click a second time in order to change the name of the component. I'm going to type out side panel for the component name. We'll now need to sketch out the side panel shape and then we'll turn it into a three dimensional body. I'm going to hit the keyboard shortcut letter L as in Lima to activate the line command. Then I'll select the YZ origin plane as the plane to sketch on. I'm going to start drawing from the origin point, so I'll click at the origin point and I'll drag my mouse cursor to the right. For the distance, I'll start to type out the width parameter and then I'll select that from the list. Then I'll click to set the line in place making sure it's a horizontal line at zero degrees. With the line tool still active, I'll move my mouse cursor up. Now I don't know the exact length of this line as I want it to be angled, so it will be a little bit longer than the total height. I'm going to hit the tab key until my cursor is in the degree input field and I'll type out 85 degrees. Then I'll hit the tab key to lock that degree in place, as you'll see it won't change when I move my mouse cursor around. Only the height will change. I'm going to dimension the height in just a minute, so I'll click anywhere to place the line. I'm going to hit the escape key on my keyboard to exit the line command, and then I'll right click in order to quickly select the repeat line option. This will let us draw the same angle on the opposite side. I'll click at the origin point and then I'll type out 85 degrees, followed by hitting the tab key. Then I'm going to click to place this line where it snaps into place at the same distance as the previous line. Now if yours doesn't seem to be snapping, then be sure to turn on the snap option in your sketch palette. Next, I'm going to click across to the other side to connect this and to close off the profile. Again, we want to add the height parameter to the overall height of our shoe rack. To do this, I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter D as in Delta to activate the sketch dimension tool. Then I'll simply click the bottom line and then I'll click the top line and I'll just click somewhere over to the left of the sketch to place the dimension. 
I can then type out the height user parameter in the dimension input field. After that, I'll click the enter key on my keyboard, which confirms the dimension, and you'll see that the sketch updates accordingly. We'll now want to turn this two-dimensional sketch into our three-dimensional side panel. I'll hit the extrude command in the toolbar, and one cool thing you'll notice is that the extrude command automatically selected our sketch profile. This was a new feature that was just released for the May 2019 update. And to clarify how it works, when you activate the extrude command, it will auto select the profile if you only have one single profile in the active sketch. If you've been using Fusion 360 for a while now, then you'll be happy to hear this as you're probably familiar with how often the extrude command is used. And saving this one mouse click, will really start adding up. Let me know in the comments below if you agree or disagree that this was a great addition to the extrude command. At this point, we'll want to type out the thickness parameter as we set this up to equal the thickness of our plywood. Then I'll click the OK button in the extrude dialog box. I'm now going to create the first slot in the side panel, which is where the cross beams will snap into place. After creating the first one, we'll use the pattern command to quickly create the rest of them. I'm going to hit the keyboard shortcut letter R as in Romeo to activate the rectangle command. Then I'll select the surface of the side panel as the surface to create the sketch on. Next, I'll be sure to select the center rectangle option in the sketch palette before starting the sketch. Now I'm using the center rectangle as I want this rectangle to be centered on the side panel. I'm going to hover my mouse near the bottom where the midpoint triangle icon appears. Then I'll move my mouse cursor upwards and I'm just going to click to set the center of the rectangle. For the width of the slot, we'll want to make it the thickness parameter, so I'll type out thickness. However, we'll want to factor in some tolerances so this cross beam can actually slide into place. So after the thickness parameter, I'll add the plus symbol, and then I'll type out 0.05 inches. Next, I'll hit the tab key to lock that dimension in place, and for the other dimension, we'll use our crossbeam parameter. After typing out the crossbeam parameter, I'll add the plus symbol and the tolerance of 0.05 inches. Then I'll click to set the rectangle in place. At this point, I'll hit the escape key to clear all commands. And then as I select the rectangle, you'll see that I can drag it around freely. To fix this, we'll want to add a dimension from the center of the rectangle to the bottom of our side panel. I'll right click to activate the marking menu, then I'll select the sketch option. This allows me to quickly select the sketch dimension tool on the left hand side. I'll click on the center point of the rectangle and then the bottom line of the side panel. I'll drag my mouse cursor to the left and I'll click to set the dimension. Then I'll type out the cross beam parameter, the plus symbol, and then the thickness parameter to ensure that there is enough space between the bottom of the cross beams and the ground. Now to ensure this rectangle also stays centered, I'll draw a construction line from the center of the rectangle to the bottom midpoint. I'll activate the line command in the toolbar and I'll click the construction option in the sketch palette, which will create a dashed reference line. Then I'll click at the center of the rectangle in the middle of the line below. At this point, we'll want to extrude cut the hole to actually create the slot for the cross beams. I'll activate the extrude command with the keyboard shortcut letter E as in echo. You'll see because we technically have two closed profiles here, the outer shape and the rectangle, we'll have to actually select the profile to extrude. 
Then we'll need to change the operation to the cut option so this cuts away from our side panel. And lastly, we'll need to add the thickness parameter in the distance input field. And depending on the orientation of your model, you may have to add a negative or minus symbol in front of your user parameter to ensure that the cut is running towards the direction of the side panel. Lastly, I'll click the OK button to confirm the extrude cut. We'll now want to add fillets or rounded corners to this cutout before we pattern the features. I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter F as in Foxtrot to activate the fillet command. Then you can use the view cube or the orbit tool to move your model's orientation around so you can select each of the four inner corners. Once they're all selected, I'll type out the bit size 125 parameter as I'll be cutting out these inside cutouts with a 1 8 inch bit. And I'll click the OK button to confirm the fillet results. At this point, we'll pattern this cutout and then we'll finish off the side panel by adding a few more fillets. I'm going to hit the keyboard shortcut letter S as in Sierra to activate the shortcuts box. Then I'll type out rectangular pattern and I'll select that from the list. I'm going to make sure that the features option is selected for the pattern type. This will allow us to select the extrude feature and the fillet feature in the timeline. We'll then need to define the direction of the pattern. I'll select the direction selector and then I'll select the bottom line of the side panel. Notice how the word directions is plural, which means that we can select multiple directions. I'm going to use the Z axis as the second direction as we'll want to use the pattern feature to create the top row of cutouts as well. For the distance type, I'll select the spacing option. For the quantity, I'll type out five, and then for the distance, I'll type out the thickness parameter, followed by the asterisk symbol, which represents a multiplier, and then I'll type out 2.5 inches. So I'm making the gap in between each crossbeam two and a half times the thickness of the crossbeam. You'll see that as of now, the patterns are running in one direction. So I'll need to select the symmetric option for the pattern type. Next, I'll click the top arrow, which switches to the other pattern direction. For this distance, I'll type out eight inches and I'll change the pattern number to two instances. Then before clicking the OK button, I'll change the compute option to the optimize selection. Now the optimize selection is the fastest since patterns can put a heavy load on your computer's resources. Now I'm also going to add some notes on the difference between each of these compute options on my webpage for this tutorial. We're just about done with the side component. We'll just need to add a few more fillets. Once again, I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter F as in Foxtrot. Then I'm going to select the bottom two corners of the side panel. I'll type out a fillet radius of one inch. Then I'll hit the plus symbol in the dialog box to add a new selection. This will let us create another fillet with a different radius dimension. I'll select the top two corners. Then for the radius of these corners, I'll type out three inches. Lastly, I'll hit the plus symbol once again, and I'll select the front and the back faces of the side panel. Now I'm doing this because I want to add a fillet of 1 8 inch to all the edges. As one thing I dislike about a lot of flat pack furniture is that people cut it out on a CNC and they throw it together and it has sharp edges. So this 1 8 inch fillet will represent all the edges being softened up with a 1 8 inch round over router bit. For the fillet radius, I'll type out the bit size 125 parameter and then I'll click the OK button. 
We're now done with the side panel of the shoe rack, so we can start to create the cross beam. I'm going to first create a new component by selecting the Assemble drop-down list. Then, the New Component option. I'll type out cross beam for the component name. Then, the most important part here is you'll want to hit the X button next to the parent selection to ensure this component isn't nested underneath the side panel component. For the parent selector, we'll need to select the top level component in the Fusion 360 browser. Then we can click the OK button to create the component. Now that our crossbeam component is active, we can start to create the 2D sketch, which will then turn into a three-dimensional crossbeam. Now we factored in a small tolerance for the cutouts or slots, so I'm not going to worry about that for these crossbeams. I want these cross beams to have a little notch in them so they rest in these slot cutouts, which is what holds this shoe rack together. To do this, I'm simply going to draw these cross beams and then I'll move them into place. I'll click Create Sketch in the toolbar, and I'm just going to click on the inside face of the original cutout as the sketch plane. I'm just going to draw to the left of this cutout and then I'll move the component into place after it's complete. I'm going to activate the line command in the toolbar. I'll simply click anywhere to the left of the side panel, and then I'm going to draw a line straight down. I'll make this dimension the cross beam parameter, and then I'll click to set the line in place. The next line, I'm going to go back to the left. I'm going to make this one inch as I want these beams to stick out about an inch. Then I'll click to place the line. Next, I'll draw a line straight up. I'll make this one cross beam divided by two to make the notch half of the cross beam parameter. For the next line, I'll make this the thickness parameter as this will be the notch that lines up with the slot cut out. And the reason I'm not adding a tolerance here is that I've personally found it's best with flat pack furniture to simply sand one part of the notch in order to get a tight fit. I'll create a line going down with a cross beam divided by two parameter. Then I'll click to set the line in place. I'll then hit the escape key so I can draw the length parameter from the top right corner. I'll click on the corner and I'll make this line the length parameter, which if you remember at the beginning of this tutorial, we set to be 27 inches or the total length of the shoe rack. However, before I click to place this line, I'll divide the parameter by two as I'm going to mirror half of this sketch so I don't have to redraw the notch a second time. and I'll select the construction option in the sketch palette to draw a line heading down the middle of the beam with the cross beam user parameter. Lastly, before I connect the line to the other side, I'll have to turn off the construction option by selecting it. I'll click the other side and I'll hit the enter key. I'll now activate the mirror command from the sketch dropdown list. I'll select over the entire sketch, although I'll be sure to unselect the construction line as we'll use that for the mirror line. I'll select the mirror line selector and then select the dashed line. Finally, I'll click the OK button to confirm the results. You'll see we now have the notch on both sides. I'll hit the extrude button in the toolbar I'll select the closed profile, and then I'll enter the parameter of thickness before clicking the OK button. Now before we move this component into place, we'll want to add its fillets. I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter F as in Foxtrot. Then I'm going to select all four of the corner edges. 
Once they're selected, I'll add a fillet radius of crossbeam divided by two, and I'll click OK. I now want to add another fillet, so I'll right click and select Repeat Fillet. Now the reason I'm creating this as a second fillet feature is that I've personally found that Fusion 360 doesn't like when you fillet all of your edges in the same feature as these larger corner fillets. For this fillet, I'm going to select both faces of the crossbeam. Then I'll need to select the four corners of each slot. After everything is selected, I'll use the user parameter of bit size 125 to once again add a nice 1 8 inch round over to the entire piece. Now that the crossbeam component is complete, I'm actually going to save it as a copy into its own file. This will offer a few advantages. First, we'll use the other file to insert copies into our current design. This will run much faster than if we patterned this entire component. Additionally, patterning the component will leave us with only one component in the Fusion 360 browser, and we want one component for each crossbeam so we can set up the file in the CAM workspace. I'll right click on the crossbeam component and I'll select Save Copy As. Then I'll click the blue Save button. If I now open the data panel, you'll see the component is saved in the chosen folder as its own unique file. I'm actually going to right click and select Delete to delete the original component from the browser list. Then I'll right click on the file in the data panel and I'll select Insert into Current Design. This will place the file into the current design, and you'll see it actually links the file, so if I update the source file, all instances of this component will continue to update. After clicking the OK button, we're done inserting the component, and we can now move it into place. Then, I'm going to activate the Joint command by selecting it from the Assemble drop-down list. For the first part of the joint, I'll select the bottom of the slot cutout. Then I'll select the top of the crossbeam cutout. I'll make sure the joint type is set to rigid, and then I'll click the OK button. At this point, we can either copy and paste the crossbeam component, or we can right click on it in the data panel and continue to select the insert into current design option. Either way, the component will stay linked to the second file. I'm going to select the component and then I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter M as in mic to activate the move command. I'll then make sure to select the create copy option at the bottom. For the Y distance, I'll type out the thickness parameter, the asterisk symbol, and then two and a half inches. And I'll click OK to create a copy that's in place. Now I'm not going to worry about any joints for now, as we'll want to lay all these components flat at the end of this tutorial, and we can always create a rigid group. I'll select the copied component, and I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter M. I'll then follow the same steps. I'll make sure to select the Create Copy option at the bottom. And for the Y distance, I'll type out thickness times two and a half inches, and then I'll click OK. I'm then going to follow these same steps once again to create the first two crossbeams. But this time, I'll have to add a minus symbol in front of the distance and I'm also going to speed up this part of the tutorial so it's not too repetitive. Next, for the top components, I'll hold down the Shift key 
and I'll select all five of the cross beams by selecting the top of the list and the bottom of the list in the Fusion 360 browser. Then I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter M. I'll make sure to select Create Copy once again. This time I'll have to type out 8 inches in the Z distance input field, and then I'll click the OK button. Now to get rid of these annoying construction planes, we'll have to hide it in the original file. I'll open up the file from the data panel, and I'll toggle off the construction plane folder in the Fusion 360 browser. Then I'll hit the Save button. When I move back to the main design file, you'll see that we now have a warning message that a component is out of date. To fix this, we'll need to refresh the linked component by right-clicking on the top-level component, and I'll select Get All Latest. And just like that, you'll see that all of them update at once since they are linked to the same file. Now to finish off our design, we'll want to copy the side component to the other side. I'll select the component in the browser, and then I'll hit the keyboard shortcut letter M. I'll make sure to select the Create Copy option, and for the X distance, I'll type out 24.25 inches, and then I'll click the OK button. In its current state, our model only has one joint applied to it which means that our components can be moved all over the place if we click and drag on them. Now, if you want your model to stay intact, you can always apply a rigid group joint. I'll select the Assemble drop-down list, and then I'll select the Rigid Group option. Then, I'm just going to shift-click the component list in the browser. You'll see that we get this warning message because our first beam component also has a rigid joint applied. And I'll just go ahead and click yes because we still want to create this rigid group joint. Now you'll see that no matter where I click on the model, the entire model moves together. Before I finish off this tutorial by showing you how to lay everything flat, to get it ready for the CAM workspace, I'll just quickly add the appearance of wood. I'll right click in the canvas window and I'll select the appearance option. Then I'm going to type out wood in the search bar. Unfortunately, Fusion 360 does not have a plywood material because of the complex nature of the 3D mapping. So, we'll just have to use another wood type. I'm just going to find the 3D oak unfinished appearance. And then I'll drag and drop that onto the top level component in the browser, which applies the appearance to all of the components at once. Now, the first way we could lay all these components flat is by manually moving them into place one by one. However, I'm a big advocate for efficiency, so I'm going to use a free add-in that's called Nestor. I've linked to that on my website resource page for this tutorial at productdesignonline.com forward slash number two. Now I'm not gonna show you how to install this, so I'll also link to the instructions on how to install the add-in. Once the add-in is installed, you'll be able to access it from the add-ins drop-down list. First, I'm going to create one last component so we can visualize our sheet of plywood. I'll right-click on the top-level component and I'll select New Component. I'll title this one 4 by 8 feet plywood. Then I'm going to select the two-point rectangle in the toolbar and if you get a warning message about the position of your components, you can just hit the Continue button. I'm going to click on the XY plane as the plane to sketch on, and I'll just click on the center origin. I'm going to make this 8 feet in length and 4 feet in width. And then I'll hit the Enter key. Then I'm going to hit E for Extrude, and I'll type out the thickness parameter 
before clicking the OK button. Notice how the appearance of wood was automatically applied since we originally dropped that on the top level component. I'll now activate the top level component so we can see everything. And I'll click the home icon so everything is within the boundaries of the canvas window. Before using the add-in, I'll go ahead and toggle open the joints folder and I'm going to delete the joints. I found that the joints sometimes affect the outcome of this nester add-in, so it's better off to just get rid of them. Now I'm going to then select the add-ins drop-down list and I'll select the nester add-in. You'll see that we first have to select our base feature. The base feature is what all the components will snap to as joints are automatically applied. In our case, we'll select the sheet of plywood that we just created. Next, we'll have to select the side faces of our components that we're going to cut out. So I'll just select them one by one, being extremely careful to only select the side faces. For the direction edge, I'll select the short edge of the sheet of plywood. And lastly, the component spacing lets us define the spacing between each component. I'll change this to three inches so there's plenty of space between each component. Then I'll click the OK button to run the add-in and to see what happens. You'll see that overall this worked pretty well. We just need to rearrange some of the components. There's also one weird quirk with this add-in that I want to point out. And that's the fact that you need to move at least one of the components before it will actually let you capture their position. I'm going to head to the select dropdown list and I'll select the selection priority flyout folder. Then I'll select the Select Component Priority option, which will ensure we're selecting just components, making it even easier for us to move them. I'll just move one slightly to the left and I'm going to hit the Capture Position in the toolbar. Then before I try to rearrange all of the components, I'm just going to ground the sheet of plywood so it doesn't move which will help us as we try to move the rest of the components. I'll right click on the plywood component in the browser and I'll select the ground option. Now this freezes or grounds the component so it will stay put where it currently is located. I can now move the components one by one or by selecting multiple at one time as I hold down the shift key and I can move them into their desired location. And of course, don't forget to hit the capture position button so the components don't revert back to their original position. As you can see, this add-in was a huge time saver. It did about three fourths of the work for us. At this point, you could head to the CAM or manufacturer workspace to set this file up to match your CNC and Flatpak design settings. One last thing to note, as I created this design, I added fillets to all of the edges to better visualize what this would look like in real life. However, it would be best if I got rid of them before setting up the cam file. To do this without deleting them, I would simply right click on the fillet commands in the timeline, and I'd select the suppress feature option. This way, I can always unsuppress the feature if I'm using the model to create a rendering or for any other three-dimensional purposes. Lastly, I just want to make you aware of another neat plugin for adding dogbone fillets to the corners, which I've also added to the list of resources on my webpage. Now, if you made it to the end of this video, then let me know by commenting below whether or not you have access to a CNC machine and if you're going to give Flatpak Furniture Design a try. As always, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this tutorial. 
If you've enjoyed this tutorial, please click that thumbs up icon and click on that playlist in the lower right hand corner to watch more woodworking related tutorials. To be part of the product design online community, be sure to click that red subscribe button and click that little bell icon to be notified of more Fusion 360 tutorials.